Hello, everybody, and welcome to this special Duke University event on behalf of the fantastic documentary, Assassins. My name is Dave Carger. I am a graduate of Duke class of 1995, and I'm also a host on Turner Classic Movies, and I'm very happy to be here tonight. Uh, before we start, there's a lot of groups at Duke University that have collaborated to put this event together tonight. They are Demon Live, Demon stands for Duke Entertainment Media and Arts Network, Duke Arts, Duke Alumni, Duke Asian Alumni Alliance, Duke LGBTQ Plus Network, Screen Society, Duke Create, and the Center for Documentary Studies. Uh, so happy to have hundreds of you watching. There's, uh, we've broken records tonight as far as Duke alumni events are concerned, and that's uh, really great. After I talk to the filmmakers of Assassins, uh, we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of the collaborators across the university who assisted with outreach for tonight's event. So you'll meet some of them and hear from them as well. Also just wanna make it clear to everyone, we are uh, recording this Zoom session tonight to stream later um, on Demon Live. So tonight we're gonna hear from several people who helped put this film together, uh, many of whom who are Duke grads. And then I'm gonna open it up to questions from all of you that are watching. So at the bottom of your Zoom screen, you'll see a Q&A button. And I see that several people have already submitted questions, which is great. So keep it up. And after I ask my questions, uh, we'll be going through some of the questions that you all are asking um, for tonight's phenomenal group of panelists. So let me introduce them one by one. First of all, the director uh, of the movie Assassins, Duke class of 2004, Ryan White. Ryan has made several documentaries uh, on Serena Williams. Um, he also has directed the docu-series, The Keepers on Netflix and Visible out on television um, for Apple TV Plus. So hello, Ryan, great to see you. Hi, Dave, thanks for doing this. I'm so happy to do it. Um, also joining us tonight is Doug Bach Clark. Doug is Duke class of 2009, and he is a correspondent for GQ, also contributes to New York Times Magazine and The New Yorker. And he wrote the article in GQ called The Untold Story of the Accidental Assassins of North Korea that was published uh, in GQ in September of 2017, just seven months after the murder of Kim Jong-nam. So uh, Doug, it's great to be with you. Well, thanks for having me. You're also an executive producer of the documentary. We should uh, let people know and the document the, your article led to this documentary. Um, also joining us is Jessica Hargrave. Jessica, if I'm not mistaken, is a high school friend of Ryan's, right guys? Elementary. El elementary school. So you guys go way back. Your partners at Tripod Media uh, which is the company that produced Assassins and all of the projects that Ryan has directed. Jessica is the producer of the movie, an Emory grad, but the daughter of two Duke grads. My mom and dad. <laughs> <laughs> so they're watching tonight. Great to be with you too, Jessica. And then finally, Grace Othout is here. Grace is class of 2016 from Duke, someone who I got to meet when she was still a student and I was a visiting alum speaking to some students who were interested in entertainment. Grace is the associate producer of Assassins and someone who has worked with Ryan and Jessica on several tripod uh, projects. So Grace, great to be with you too. Thanks so much for having us. So I'm gonna be asking a lot of you guys about the Duke connections uh, that led to this, because there's many, um, in addition to kind of the, the more substantive things about the film itself. But um, I, I would love to start with you, Doug, because I just wanna hear a little bit more about what hooked you uh, about this story that when it happened, you immediately uh, started working on this uh, very acclaimed article in GQ. What was your interest when you heard about this? So when I first heard about the assassination of Kim Jong-nam, I, I think like everyone else, I was just blown away. Um, two women smearing a chemical weapon on the face of the half-brother of the dictator of North Korea. Um, doesn't get much crazier than that. But of course, then the story took another turn, which was that these two women improbably claimed that they had been tricked into doing it in a sort of uh, prank video scenario. And at first, I assumed that this there was no way that this was true. 
But then I started to look a little bit more into their stories. Um, I had spent several years in Indonesia after graduating from Duke. Um, and one of the women was an Indonesian woman who had been a migrant laborer. Um, and I had interacted with a lot of women who had a similar background to her. And um, the more I sort of heard what she said, and then I sort of went on social media and found some of her friends and family. And I started to think, well, you know, maybe it could be possible. It was probably unlikely, but it was maybe possible to, that this woman was telling the truth. And so I, you know, I, I called up my editor and said, you know, I, I'd like to look into this. And then I got on a plane to Asia and started following her steps. And then Ryan, can you tell me how you connected with Doug once you've read his piece? Uh, I think Doug needs to tell me how I connected with Doug because I can't even remember. I know we get pitched a ton of articles as documentary filmmakers, especially in the last five or six years since documentaries have become much more popular. And we almost always say no to all of them. So, but I don't remember, Doug, how did, how did we end up connecting at the beginning? Well, so I think it was, I don't remember if it was through a Demon Weekend officially or another Demon event at Duke. Um, but it's, it's all thanks to Demon and to Amy Unell. Um, shout, shout out to her and, and the whole process here. Um, but so after I had been assigned the article, I spent you know maybe half a year or so. Um, I went to South Korea, um, uh, Malaysia, Indonesia, um, sort of tracking down where these women um, had gone, what they had done. And what I found was that it was very likely that they were telling the truth. But by the time I finished my article, about seven months after the killing had happened, the trial still hadn't um, actually been done yet. The evidence that I found suggested that the women probably hadn't known um, that these the spies who were recruiting them were actually North Koreans, and they probably had believed that they'd been doing a prank. But that wasn't certain. The trial hadn't happened yet. Not all of the evidence was out there. Um, and so I knew that the trial was going to was going to happen. The article came out; it got a lot of attention. And I also knew that there was a lot of video footage that was floating around: the CCTV footage, a lot of other things. And I knew that this story wasn't fully over; um, that it was still ongoing. And so I, you know, I thought maybe you could make a really amazing documentary out of this. Um, and Amy was kind enough to connect me to Ryan. And then Ryan and um, Jess and, and Grace sort of looked over the article and um, I was lucky enough that they, they took me on. So Ryan I remember, I remember uh, being on a walk with Doug on Campus Drive actually. And so it must've been Demon Weekend that we met. Cause I remember we were walking and you left the bus stop and like walked up one of those hills. And I guess <laughs> that was our first conversation about this, but. I think we were on East Campus somewhere. I think there was a showing of of one of your movies at, yeah. on East Campus. And then we met and walked down um, sort of over towards West Campus uh -oh. and had, had yeah. a talk about it. And, it, was and all, of, uh, it was all hatched on Campus Drive. Ex exactly, uh, Campus Drive is the place to make it happen. Because literally like, I think, it might have even been less than a month later after meeting Doug, I was on a flight with him to Malaysia for the first like exploratory trip. So like Doug's article was very convincing, but like he said, it wasn't, it, we weren't certain that the women were telling the truth for sure. We weren't beginning uh, the film thinking like these women are definitely innocent. Um, and so it was that first exploratory trip where it was Doug and myself, uh, and we took our we took my our DP, our cameraman, John Benham. Um, that was supposed to be more of like a research exploratory trip, but we ended up shooting a ton because Doug started introducing us to all of his sources, all of those undercover sources that were in the articles. Then in the article, then we started uh, shooting interviews with them when they allowed it, um, and so that's kind of where it all began. And it was after that first shoot that. I think we were totally sold that there was a movie there because it's not it's not it's often that we will go on a research trip and decide there's not a movie there or something but this is one where we were definitely sold after the first trip. Jessica from a producer's point of view I mean this is not the kind of documentary about something that happened 20 years ago and you can kind of take your time because you've got time. This was happening 
like at that moment. So what kind of pressure did that put on you guys to make sure that you were getting everything since time was really of the essence? Um, in any documentary, when you hear there's a trial, I feel like Ryan and I at first are like, no, please don't let there be a trial because they're so unpredictable. They can take lots of twists and turns. They can be immediate or they can take forever. And there were a lot of challenges with this film. In addition to the fact that it was a trial, it's an international trial. It takes over 24 hours to get there. So it was really a challenge to be sure that we could cover all of the elements and all of the stages that we needed to cover. So I think that we we knew the importance of it though, in terms of the pressure that you that you just referenced. I think as we got further and further into it, the pressure was really about the fact that we felt like this story wasn't coming out and that we really had a responsibility to tell it. Doug had written an amazing article, but a lot of the Western or at least American press hadn't really covered it very much. Um, and as Ryan was talking about, we were getting more and more information from the attorneys and meeting more and more sources. And the further we got into it, the more that we learned, the more we were convinced of their innocence. And that was the pressure. How do we make sure that we are able to tell that story? Because the more we were convinced of their innocence, we also were recognizing the more likely it seemed that they were going to die. Grace, I really want to hear from you just because there are so many people watching this who are current Duke students or recent alums. And here you are, you know, now four and a half years out of Duke and you've gotten screen credits on so many wonderful documentaries that you've worked on with Jess and Ryan. And this is a relationship that came out of a meeting on campus as well. Can you explain how you guys all connected and, and what exactly do you do on these films and what did you do on this film particularly? Yeah, of course. So, um... When I was a freshman, it was one of the first years that they were doing the Demon Weekend where, you know, they have all panels and a ton of Duke alums who work in the entertainment and media industry come to campus. And my freshman year, I didn't really know 100% what I wanted to do, but I knew I was interested in news and broadcast journalism and documentary film. And I, one of the panels I went to was actually Ryan's panel talking about his film Pelado, which he made with other Dukies as well. There's a lot of Duke connections here. And um, flash forward to my senior year, I um, was taking a class with Professor Adam Hollowell, Ethics in an Unjust World, who was actually a classmate of Ryan's and I flunched him. So everybody who ever forgets to flunch their professors, which is an amazing program at Duke, um, definitely take advantage of it. And I was telling him about my interests and he said, oh, have you ever seen the case against eight? And I was like, I'm a huge fan. And did you know that the director is actually a Duke alum? And he was like, I did know that. And it's my classmate, Ryan White. And so he connected us and Ryan was coming back to campus like he often does to speak in doc studies classes or to do demon events. And we got to meet up for 15 minutes um, just to talk about you know what I was interested in and what I wanted to do when I graduated. And I was able to tell him I've actually watched a lot of your films because I uh, went to your panel my freshman year through Demon and I was at Beach Week my senior year when Ryan called me and said I got a PA on my new project The Keepers and I had accepted a job somewhere else and um, I wasn't sure what I was going to do and then Ryan sent me Ryan and Jess we jumped on the phone and they sent me the sizzle for the keepers and when I saw it I was just blown away and knew I had to go to LA for the first time and pursue this career with them so it was just very serendipitous and now we have a lot of people on our team who um, have worked for Duke or have attended Duke I should say as well and um, yeah it's just been an amazing program um demon has bringing that opportunity and then for an associate producer you know I started out as a PA then I was a production coordinator and then became an associate producer on the last couple of projects that we've gotten to work on which is amazing and I think it's really hard for producers to describe everything that they do I like to say that we are involved in everything that is needed for the project to get across the finish line. So that can be archival, that can be legal concerns, that can be budgetary concerns, that's planning shoots. So we're involved in every stage of production, 
But on this project specifically, I jumped in towards the end and helped a lot with our archival and legal um, analysis on the film, which was a new challenge for us dealing with international sources. Ryan, what was the, when you think back to this whole process, what was the toughest bit or interview or piece of footage or fact to, to track down? Well, I guess everyone just watched the film, so I won't be spoiling anything. I try to be careful if, if I'm doing interviews where people haven't watched the film yet, because no one seems to know this story. So there's like real built-in suspense for audiences. So I'm always begging journalists not to give away the ending and I'm asking audiences not to Google it before they go into it. Um, but because presumably everyone just watched the film, I think the hardest part, one of the hardest parts for sure was getting the women to participate. Um, you know, they had been in jail for two years in solitary confinement. I had no access to them. So it was the first time I made a film where I didn't know my main subjects, even though they were my main characters, uh, they literally wouldn't recognize me on the street. Uh, and so two years after the ordeal, when they're finally out of prison and back in their home countries and hometowns, they have a new film crew coming to them saying like, no, 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 we know you were just tricked into the exact same thing by a different film crew, but you can trust us. And so um, Doug, Doug, you, you mentioned at the beginning, EP'd uh, the film as well, executive produced the film. He did a lot of trips with me to, I don't remember how many, Doug, maybe three or four times you came with me to Asia. Um, and he had made great inroads in writing his article with Siti's family. Uh, so City, we were definitely a sort of leg up because Doug had, by that point, you know, it took us, I think, two and a half years to make the film and Doug had been making it a year before. So her family knew us pretty well by that point. Uh, so she was a little bit easier to persuade to participate. Duan, the Vietnamese woman, was a lot harder uh, to get to participate. She was very, you know, our film kind of ends with that scene. We call it the paparazzi scene where she's, entering the, the Hanoi airport and she looks like a movie star and there's flash bulbs all around her. She's staying, she still wants to be an actress. Uh, and that's the end of our film, but you know, within a couple months, by the time I met Duan, which was probably a couple months after she had been home, it was like a completely different woman who had a totally, because she had been in jail. She, despite having gone through the ordeal, she wasn't experiencing the world outside and how people were perceiving her at all while she was in Malaysia. So it wasn't until she landed back in Vietnam that she started to go online or she people started to run into her on the streets and say nasty things to her. Uh, and so by that point, she was a totally different person than I think she was before this experience. And she didn't want any attention at all. Like when I was with Duan in Vietnam, I think there were three or four days where there we, where she didn't want to have a camera at all around before it was just her and I hanging out. And she kept saying she didn't want to uh, have her face on camera. She had changed her appearance so that people wouldn't recognize her. She wouldn't allow me to use her name in public, even her first name, because she was afraid people would know she's that woman. Uh, so getting her to participate was probably the biggest challenge. And she just watched the film for the first time and really and really loved it. Uh, and we just did a, a Q and A with her as well that people can check out with, with Doug last week. Uh, and so I was so relieved to hear that she thought it was a positive experience and she was happy that she had done the film because she was, she was really, really concerned about doing it. Sure. Um, there's been so many great questions coming in that I'm just gonna start getting to them now. Uh, Jessica, I'm going to direct this one to you. Uh, this is a question from somebody watching our Q&A right now. Did you have any uneasiness about doing a documentary of this nature, given North Korea's tendency to exert a lot of pressure to keep stories like this from coming out? Uh, yes, that's a great question, and we definitely did. I will say, looking back, I think that we moved quickly at the beginning, and as Ryan said, he was on a plane a few weeks after um, meeting Doug, and, and then honestly had to take a step back and think, okay, what, what precautions should we be taking? We just dove right in and then we thought, okay, we are, everyone is aware of the Sony hack that happened um, several years ago and the influence and power of uh, you know, the regime and the attempts to try to use um, cyber efforts to, to present challenges to people who were telling North Korean stories. And that's what we were doing. 
So I think uh, once we really took a minute to think about that, we took as many precautions as we could. I understand that you can't make it entirely impenetrable and, and we didn't, but we did the best that we could. We met with consultants who were security consultants. We met with the FBI. Um, we took everything that would normally be on, as, ac online accessible. We took it offline, like all of the computers that the editors used were not um, attached. Like they were attached to the project and therefore not attached to the internet so that there was an air gap between them. Um, we had some burner computers for things that we thought could be problematic and we didn't want to bring down a whole system. So um, it was, I mean, we were, we're always very careful, but it's just so important and valuable. It's, you know, it's so vital to our work, but this was another layer of protection um, that we added just because of the subject matter. I mean, there could be a movie about the behind the scenes of this movie, I feel like. Yeah, it was, I mean, it was, it was great that everyone, I mean, everyone had to be really careful too, just like checking your emails and, you know, being very, very diligent, which it, it, it obviously is like a more difficult workflow, but everyone understood the importance of it. And we kept it very quiet. Um, like I remember when we finally announced our Sundance premiere, it was like, oh God, like now everyone knows that this is happening. I think we were following Doug's lead in some way in some ways with that, like another, I think we were back for the Full Frame Film Festival and we had lunch with Doug. I remember we had a lunch in downtown Durham and, and Doug made us turn our cell phones off uh, before we had the phone call. And then he told us some stuff during, during that lunch that he was really concerned about. And like for us as documentary filmmakers, I mean, we've made investigative stuff, but nothing at the, at the level of a North Korean regime. And that's been Doug's beat for a while. So I think we followed his lead on a lot of that. And at times I think we were probably like, is this a little dramatic, uh, you know? And then realize that this is like the world that Doug lives in every day. So we were just following his lead. Doug, were you ever concerned for your, I mean, I Obviously, you were taking precautions, but were you ever actually concerned for your safety at any point during any part of this process, the writing or the film? No, I, I think that the people I'm more concerned about are the sources who are often taking great risks in order to help me tell the stories, um, often because they really believe in the impacts that the stories that they're telling are going to have. Um, so. You know, it, it, it is a scary thing sometimes to write about something like North Korea or to, um, you know, go into some of the places or, or meet some of the people that one does meet in the reporting of these stories. But I, I think that, you know, I work for large um, media organizations that have my back um, and that, you know, are lawyered up and, and also have various other security consultants and other things like that. And many of the people who take a really heroic step to, you know, provide me with information um, are doing so without that backing and they're the real heroes here. Um, and I was also just really lucky in, in getting to work with Ryan and Jess that they were very, very brave and very, very good at doing the investigative work at keeping things um, tight and making sure that, you know, sources wouldn't be exposed and, you know, uh, Ryan would go into go with me into pretty much anywhere in the back alleys of Kuala Lumpur or anywhere else. Um, and, you know, also did a lot of his own legwork in Vietnam and elsewhere when I wasn't able to be there with him. So it was just, it was, I was very lucky to be part of a good team. Um, Ryan, I've noticed that a lot of the reviews uh, describe this movie in similar adjectives, clear, straightforward. Um, and one of the questions from one of the people watching is uh, the editing was really sharp. Was it not, was it hard not to go over the top and make this more melodramatic? So how much were you, was that a priority of yours and everybody else to, to have it come across that way? Well, our editor, Helen Kearns, went to Carolina. Uh, she's from Charlotte. So we're, we're a very North Carolina centric uh, uh, office. Um, and she's the best. I mean, she, I've used her on many films, including several of the ones that you've mentioned. And I knew if there was somebody who could, it is a very sensational story on its face, but you know, I think we did something similar with The Keepers, which was about the murder of a nun and child sex abuse and was, you know, at the height of popularity of, of true crime when that series came out. But the reviews of that were kind of also, you know, a different way of seeing true crime that leaned into um, a victim's experience as, a, as opposed to a perpetrator's. And so 
I think as a team, we were very conscious that why this, while this was a very sensational story, I mean, it's absurd. It's an absurdist story, right? The premise is literally unbelievable, but that there were victims at the center of it. Like undoubtedly Kim Jong-nam was a victim and never received justice in this. But if you believe the women, which we clearly do uh, by the end of the film, that there were almost, there were three victims in this and two more almost paid the ultimate price with their lives. And so we didn't want to have too much fun uh, with the premise. Um, it was also, it was a nightmare to make this story clear. I think that's why a lot of the reviews say that. It was like a Herculean feat what Helen pulled off in making it make sense because it's, a, it's, it's an assassination plot that doesn't make sense. That's why I think the CCTV plays such a key role in the film in the end. And, you know, Helen has other editors that work for her underneath her. So we have a whole editing team and their job, once we finally got our hands on all of the CCTV footage, so like dozens of DVDs from cameras all over the airport. So it was probably hundreds, if not thousands of hours from that day, they had to piece all of that together. It's not like that was written out for us, you know? So they had to, literally watch DVDs all day long and find the same six or seven people throughout the day and trace their steps. So we basically had a timeline of all the key players and what they were doing during the day. Um, and so getting our hands on that um, and our editors piecing all of that together uh, was huge in finishing the film. Uh, here's a question for all the tripod people. Grace, I'm gonna let you take this and you can speak to it from your own experience. The question is, your projects are so diverse. How do you identify potential docs for Tripod and then narrow down and select what you want to work on? So I'll, I'll address it to you this way. When you have been, when you've been talking to Jess and Ryan about, you know, working with Tripod, what have they told you as far as like their priorities? Is there anything that ties all these different kinds of films together? Well, first I'll say they're very picky. I also have tried to pitch Ryan and Jess a lot of ideas, but <laughs> they are rightfully very picky because, you know, what's different about documentary work versus other work is you're dedicated to a project for two years minimum or more. So it has to be a project you are really passionate about and that you're willing to dedicate that much time to. Um, I'll also say, for whatever re reason, whether this is purposeful or not, um, we really tend to gravitate towards um, female centric stories. In a lot of cases also um, justice centric stories, you know, that have a question of what is justice and a lot of cases where we're not getting justice from the usual systems that we look for it from. And, um, which often involves trials and stories that involve trials. And so even though Ryan and Jess don't love trials, they say that because they have a lot of experience working on films that have to do with trials. But I will say we've also expanded quite a bit. Sometimes what's nice is a new challenge. And so we've done projects before that seem very similar to work we've done in the past and then ones that are huge new challenges for one reason or another. So we are also always looking to be challenged and try something new. Yeah, but I'll let Ryan just speak to if they have anything to add there. Oh, I mean, I think that's part of Grace's job now, you know, she like, she like heads our development. So she's the one, you know, like we get, like, like I said at the beginning, we get pitched so many articles, books, podcasts that we don't have the time in the day to read them all. And Grace doesn't either, but she somehow makes the time. And so she'll report back to us. I mean, a, a sentence Grace says all the time to us will be some version of like, good book, not a tripod project, you know? And Grace knows our taste well enough at this point and our sensibilities and, you know, our patterns. Like, is Ryan gonna wanna spend years going to this place? Maybe not after having spent years in Malaysia. Uh, she knows our patterns well enough to that we just trust her. We won't read the book after that. We'll say like, okay, it's not worth our time. But if she brings something and she says, oh, there's something here or, you know, there's there, this part of it's good or this part isn't, then we'll have conversations about that. So it's not like she's portraying it to be that we always shoot down her ideas. Uh, you know, oftentimes Grace is the one bringing us that original idea or she's the sort of conduit for it. 
great. Um, Jess, here's a question that I want to direct uh, to you. How was funding for this project obtained? How do you raise money for a documentary like this about a subject that few people in the Western world have any idea about? Um, we were, were lucky enough to receive a grant um, from a company called Impact Partners, uh, which, which helps support films um, that are trying to make an impact that have some sort of social justice message at the core, uh, or so, social justice theme. Um, so we got a grant and that was how we were able to get um, our foot in the door and start to do uh, the early shoots. We also, we keep things really small, which can make a grant like that go really far. So we try, as Ryan mentioned, you know, it was Ryan, Doug, the DP, and our co-producer, Kristen Wyland, on most of the shoots, sometimes only two out of four. You know, we try to keep it very, very small for budget reasons, also in this case for security reasons and trying not to draw attention. I joke that Ryan is really pushing it on being able to pass as a backpacker, though that is his response when stopped on the street still. <laughs> um, and it has worked so far. Um, so we're able to make things like a grant like that go further than we might otherwise. Um, and then we are partnered with a company called Greenwich Entertainment, who is releasing it theatrically and on other various platforms right now. Um, it was a, a bit of a challenge, I'll acknowledge that, because of the subject matter. Um, I think that the, the, to reference this Sony hack again, I think that that is something that is in people's minds, rightfully. There are security concerns, rightfully. And so uh, it was a little bit more of a challenge than I think we had initially anticipated, but we're grateful to be with Greenwich. Uh, Doug, here's one for you. you. You mentioned this at the beginning. But what specifically convinced you, someone wants to know, that it was likely that Dewan and Siti were telling the truth when you were working on your story? So with, at the beginning, I, I actually assumed that there was a very high likelihood I would investigate and find that they were guilty and that they knew what they were doing. Um, and that would have still, I think, have been a pretty good story. I mean, it still would have been a very inv interesting investigative story to sort of track down how the mechanics of the assassination had come out. But one of the key moments was as I, I literally was able to background city steps from, you know, from her very rural village to the sweatshop she worked in Jakarta to, to the um, brothels and other places that she ended up working in Kuala Lumpur. And I kept hearing sort of stories, you know, the question had to be, how did she end up meet, meeting the North Koreans? Um, and so one thing that hadn't really been done before my investigation was trying to pin that question down. Um, and so through various means, I was able to figure out the name of the person who'd made that introduction. Um, and then I was able to figure out he was a taxi driver and the license plate of his taxi. And one of, and also sort of start to establish the patterns of where he would go on his taxi rounds. Um, and so one night I staked out one of the brothels where he often brought customers. And I actually did this for three nights in a row. And then I saw the taxi license plate come in. Um, passenger got out. I hopped into the car. I told him to get on the freeway so that he wouldn't have a good place to kick me out if he wanted to uh, get rid of me. And then I just started talking to him and he was able, he was a really a key moment where he was able to unravel a lot of the connections and what he saw and what he said was that um, City had been working as a sex worker and that these men who um, were portraying themselves as Chinese or Korean were you know, basically presenting themselves as if they wanted to make a porno or some sort of prank film and that he was there and present through a lot of um, those interactions and that she never was able to uh, so they never, there was never any indication that she could have found out they were North Koreans. And then from there, I was able to sort of keep following the path of other people who had been there through the interactions. Um, but as I wrote in the article, it was possible that perhaps they had communicated through WhatsApp or through another way to, um, that would show that she had known they were North Koreans. But one thing that happened with the documentary is we were able to get a hold of her full phone records and other things that showed that you know, she, she, you know, and I don't know, hundreds, if not thousands of texts, you know, had really no idea what she was doing. Wow. 
Um, Ryan, here's a question I want to uh, direct to you. Why do you think City's case was dismissed prior to defense? And why do you believe Doan's charges were changed? Uh, I mean, that was the biggest, that was the biggest curveball of the entire film was City. The day City was released was the most surprising day of my career. Nobody saw it coming, including the judge in the courtroom who was shocked. Uh, and so all of the back channeling that was happening amongst, you know, we never expected to make a film that would, that ended that would be so geopolitical and about international relations and foreign diplomacy. Like I knew nothing about that world before starting to make this film. The relationships between Malaysia, North Korea, and Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, but I think once the judge made his ruling, you know, it's the British system of law there. And so the prosecution made their case. The case was obviously very one-sided, didn't acknowledge North Korea at all, was very narrowly focused and said these women admitted it. What they did led to his death, therefore they need to be executed. And when the judge made his ruling, you know, halfway through the trial, it he emphatically said that he thought the women were guilty in that ruling. So I think everything changed. I think that's when the lawyers recognized like, oh shit, our clients are most likely gonna die. We're gonna open up everything to these documentary filmmakers because if the truth isn't gonna come out in the trial, perhaps they can get the truth out there. And then I think that's when the, their home countries, the foreign government started realizing, oh shit, these women are actually gonna die. And you know they have this documentary crew sniffing around saying like, we feel like this isn't all adding up. Why is the trial one-sided? So it's not like everyone didn't know we were there and we're planning on telling the story. Uh, and so who knows what happened in those, in, in that, those back channeling ways between the foreign leaders, but I don't think I don't think Duan would be alive if City's government hadn't done that. I mean, it, all signs were pointing towards their execution. So I think the Indonesian government saved the day. And Jess referenced earlier, like we were prepared for them to die. That's what everybody was telling us was gonna happen. Um, Doug was saying that from the beginning, like we knew we were going into this film with the idea, like the odds are stacked against them. Um, and so we were prepared that if they were going to be convicted that we were gonna release the film like the moment they were convicted during some small appeals process in Malaysia in hopes that it would get the truth out there. Um, thank God that didn't happen in the end, but I think that's only because of those last ditch efforts that the Indonesian government made. So I think they really did save the day and they saved the film because I don't even know if we could have put out a film if the ending was the women dying, it would, I think it would have been too much of a miscarriage of justice. Yeah. Um, here's a question that I find interesting and, and Jess and Grace, you guys tell me which of the two of you this is a better question for. Um, did you ever receive comment from any US government entity, CIA or otherwise, as to their position on this incident or your portrayal of it in the movie? I don't know who was doing the outreach uh, on your team to the government. Mm -hmm. Ryan? Um, we did not receive any official word from any government organizations. I'll let Doug decide whether he speaks to the fact that he heard from a few at points um, in his travels, but uh, we never received any official notification about it. As mentioned, we did have a meeting with the FBI, um, but that was more about the threat that existed uh, to, or the potential threat that existed um, from the North Korean regime and less so about the CIA's involvement in this. Um, the, it was interesting to us when that came out because you're always like, Kim Jong-nam was a constant threat to Kim Jong-un because of his position, um, because of his age and uh, because of the bloodline. But you know, why now, why then? And then when it was revealed that he had been meeting with the CIA and had met with them right you know, prior to his death, you do have to wonder if that is what helped trigger this moment to be the moment in which it happened. I will add though, something that we weren't able to include, um, unfortunately, this is just the thing you have to trim it down so much is that there was actually an incident, um, I think it was just a couple months prior when Duan and Sitsi and Kim Jong-nam and the North Korean operatives were all in Phnom Penh. Um, we were able to, to trace this through their flight records um, and through Interpol photos of the, the operatives and they were all in Phnom Penh. And, as Duan and Siti say, you could even find it on their social media. We didn't, I didn't have to do anything today. I just stayed in my hotel room. So what, was there a previous attempt? Was there going to be an attempt previously that was some, for some reason called off potentially? Um, so 
even though it took a minute for us to find out about these CIA meetings, you know, one assumes that they'd been going on for quite a while and that, and that the regime was aware of them. Wow. Okay. There's so many great questions. I'm going to try to get through as many of these in the little bit of time that we have left, guys. Um, Ryan, here's one for you. Did you ever consider or try to interview the Malaysian judge who was presiding over the trial? Yeah. And he actually just saw the film I heard, <laughs> uh, which I was a little bit worried about because we we got our hands on that trial audio, which was a little dicey because they, were, you, they strictly don't allow cameras in the courtroom there. So I was always a little worried. Uh, how that was gonna be perceived that we had gotten our hands on that in some way. But supposedly the reaction I got, so one of the lawyers, Mr. Hisham, who represented Dwan, uh, watched the film and then just said, oh, by the way, I forwarded it to the judge for him to watch and he liked it a lot too. He thought it was very fair. Uh, so I don't, I don't know why he liked it a lot because I think it makes, uh, I think it makes his, his uh, ruling look a little bit uh, uh, severe to say the least, but he was apparently okay with it. But yeah, we reached out to the prosecution and to the judge um, without any success. That's not uncommon. Like, like we've said, we've made enough films about civil and criminal trials and murder trials before. And often um, the, the judges often can't, at least in the US, they're not allowed to often comment. I don't know about Malaysia, but it's also not rare that the prosecution doesn't want to be a part of a film that is probably sniffing around on whether they are unjustly prosecuting someone. So they said no as well. That's why we have so many press conferences with the prosecutors in the film, because that was really how we represented their point of view. Well, clearly, even in Malaysia, there's no such thing as bad press, Ryan. All, all press, press, even if you're a judge in Malaysia. Um, Doug, what were your first interactions with Siti and Doan like? So I only, I only got to interact with them once they were freed through the diplomatic process um, during at the, sort of at the end of the film. Um, you know, before that they were locked away. Um, I was not, I was able to dialogue and interface with their lawyers. Um, but, you know, I, I, for me, one of the most incredible experiences in making this film was getting to sit and just eat lunch on the floor of City's house. Um, it's, it's customary to sort of sit and eat communally uh, in, in many Indonesian families um, with Ryan and, and the rest of the film team, as well as Sudi and her parents. And it was just a very traditional, very simple lunch, um, you know, just, just uh, basically fried chicken um, with, with spices and just um, just seeing them all together and knowing that, you know, they were safe and that this sort of terrible nightmare was over was an incredibly powerful experience, um, you know, to, to have that weight lifted off my shoulders and, and I'm sure for Ryan and everyone else as well. Um, and that, that for me was just uh, unforgettable. I think, I think that's a great point. And I'm sure Doug, you're the same because you worked on it even longer than I did. I had built up this image of who these women were going to be because I was so obsessed with them for years. And so I, I had chills hearing Doug talking about that because I had chills, like we could hear Siti's voice as we were walking up to her home. And Doug was like, oh, I think that's Siti. And like rounding the corner and opening the door and just seeing this like, regular girl just sitting there smiling and start talking to us and it was so humanizing in that way like we I, I knew they were innocent by that point or I thought they were innocent but I had still built up this 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 version of both of them and neither of those versions ended up being true to who they are in the end so like Siti's a great example I just assumed because of the hard life that she had lived that we had been telling in our film you know we had been to the sweatshop where she had lived and worked. We had been to the, the places where she was living and doing sex work. I would have just assumed she was a more reserved, quiet personality because I had placed that perception upon her that her life had been so hard. She could not have been a bigger personality. She is so bubbly, all jokes, like all, like the entire time was laughing. Um, and that's just not what I expected her to be. So I agree with Doug, like that was, probably the most special moment was just meeting both of them because it was so real. It was so humanizing. Like, oh, these are actually the women that we've been obsessed with for the last three years and they're nothing like what we thought they were gonna be like. 
Mm. Uh, Jess, I'll give this one to you. Someone's curious to know how did the girls find their lawyers and how did the lawyers get paid? Um, neither of the women could have afforded the lawyers that they had. Um, they had really amazing lawyers, Mr. Hisham and Mr. Guir, both really well respected um, and uh, really good at their jobs. But and both of them were were hired essentially via the, the government. So Mr. Gui, whenever someone is accused of a crime in Malaysia, if that person is, uh, sorry, capital crime, um, and if that person is an Indonesian, then it automatically goes to his firm. So he has some arrangement that's pre, um, pre-arranged. And when he saw, or when his firm saw that it was an Indonesian woman, they knew it would be their case. In the case of Duan, um, the Vietnam Bar Association is the organization that connected Duan with Mr. Hisham and um, brought him on board to represent her in her tri- in the trial. Um, but I think uh, you know, and both of those attorneys were, as Ryan said, you know, they were really, really, um, they were really, really motivated. They were very brave, and they were also understood at some point, like perhaps working with us would be to their advantage as well, or would be to the women's advantage more so because as the trial went on, this information wasn't coming out in the trial. They had it all in front of them, but nobody was getting to see it. Um, So they were more open to working with us. Grace, what do you say to people that you meet, current students, people who are a year or two out of school who are interested in, you know, having an experience like you're having right now? I mean, and you were such a go-getter and you really made this happen for yourself, but the world is so topsy-turvy right now, the entertainment world and the world in general, what would you say to a student who's watching this or a very recent alum who's watching this who wants to basically do what you did, work your way up? Yeah, to students, I always say, especially by your senior year, you think to yourself, you know, I've done, I've gone to all these seminars, or I've gone to all these panels, I've done all these things and nothing has come of it. And the reason Duke has those opportunities in place is because it just takes one meeting with somebody to change your trajectory, just like it takes one class at Duke to change your interests in your career. Um, and so keep flinching, keep going to demon. You never know when you're gonna meet that person, especially if you feel like you still don't know what you wanna do. Um, and I can say as a recent grad, I now miss hugely all of the resources that were available to me as an undergrad. You know, it's almost too many things. You can't do them all, um, but take advantage of as many of them as you can. And to recent grads, I tell people all the time, the documentary world is relatively small in the entertainment industry and people are extremely friendly and forthcoming with information. And so if you're a fan of a specific documentarian's work, so make sure you really watch documentary work and know have, know your stuff and know your taste. And if you're a fan, shoot them an email or see if they're doing a panel that you can attend and see if there's a way you can get connected with them um, or just check out who else is associated with them. And a cold email, you would be surprised in the documentary world can actually get a response. So keep the hustle going. I think um, it's interesting too, for those who are thinking about it, and Grace, I think you could speak to this, is um, working in documentary film, it's often a small team. We often rely on our team members to contribute a lot. And I think that one of the things you've seen from the start is that like you will see your work on the screen. You will say, I am the reason that that exists on in this movie. And I think Assassins is actually a great example of that. Um, because when we were starting the film, we were really focusing on the women. We wanted this to be the women's stories, and that is what we were focused on for, uh, well, throughout the film, but particularly at the beginning and the middle. And then we realized that in, in order to understand the women's stories, you really had to take a step back and understand um, the North Korean regime story. Um, and we were struggling. Uh, we found Anna Fifield, the woman who speaks in the film, and she was able to um, to tell a lot of the story, but we were struggling to find visuals and Grace is the reason that we found those visuals. That's so great. Do you wanna tell us Grace? I think it's really interesting. (laughs) Sure. Well, anything, any documentary that we work on, we, we become completely immersed in the subject matter. And I like to think we kind of become mini experts on the subject. And in this case, one of the areas we became a mini expert was North Korea and 
I don't want to say we're real experts because that's who we ended up relying on. We're the real experts like Anna Fifield, who you all saw in the documentary. But then there's other people who work in the background who um, one of them is Martin Williams, who he in the, within the last five years, North Korea only has one television station where they do broadcasts and the 8 p.m. news broadcast. And if anybody's curious on finding out about North Korea, you can watch those broadcasts. And they're exactly what you imagine, except crazier. They are just basically propaganda, but fascinating to watch. And um, we were looking for high definition versions of these broadcasts and um, which they has only recently become a development in North Korea. And Martin is this expert who works with 38 North, which is an organization that, you know, looks at North Korea, follows everything that's going on there because it's basically a black hole. There's very little intelligence that we know about there. And, but there are some satellites, including a Boeing satellite, um, where you can get the daily broadcast from North Korea. And this is a guy who has dedicated his life to following what the intelligence in North Korea. And he, literally downloads the daily broadcasts every day. And um, everything else we were finding online was very low quality um, because it takes so much technological savvy and I wouldn't be able to explain it in detail to anyone, but Martin certainly would. And it's just a wonderful experience to get to credit those true experts and work alongside them in documentaries too and showcase the work that they've been doing for years as well. And they're always the biggest advocates for our projects too because they want more people to know and they obviously feel like this subject matter is extremely important. That's great. Okay, with the last one minute that I have left, Ryan, let me just finish with you and, and Doug, if you have anything to add with this too. Someone wants to know what's next for this story? Is there any unfinished business you know, that, that either of you would be curious to follow. Oh boy, there's the best sequel ever to this film that I'm not going to make and I'm going to let Doug talk about it because it is so, ten there is such a great next chapter to this film, um, but I just don't want to do it. But Doug, Doug, why don't you tell the audience what that is? Because it is fascinating. So um, Kim Jong-nam had a son and when the assassination happened, that son um, who had been in somewhere in Eastern Europe, if I remember correctly, disappeared. And if, shortly thereafter, a video appeared online wherein he, the son, uh, declared he was alive and then thanked a mysterious organization um, for saving him. And it wasn't the CIA, it wasn't the governmental um, operation. It was just the secret anti-North Korean resistance operation. Um, and it's recently come out by great reporting, not by myself, but other, other um, really great reporters, that um, there was a group of Americans who, uh, many who had Korean ancestry or had other connections to Korea, who were working to bring down the North Korean regime in basically a rebel movement. Um, and because Kim Jong-nam's son according to some definitions, would be sort of like the heir apparent. They had smuggled him out. Um, they had smuggled him to safety and then um, uh, may or may not have let him go to the CIA. And so there, there are more chapters in this story to come and we're all looking forward to when they will be able to be publicly told. That's great. Well, I congratulate you all on this riveting documentary and I so appreciate all of you taking the time, Ryan White, Jessica Hargrave, Doug Buck Clark, Grace Othout. Uh, the movie is Assassins. Ryan, how can people tell their friends and family that they can find this movie? Oh, uh, it's out on video on demand right now. So all those channels like uh, Amazon Prime, iTunes, Xbox, you can uh, rent it right now. Great. Well, hopefully people will tell everybody about it. And thanks to all the people who stuck around for this q and I hope you enjoyed it. Um, and really thank you for watching. And a big shout out, as Doug said, to Amy Unell, who works at Duke, particularly with Demon, and really helped put this all together. But as uh, we talked about in the beginning, there were a lot of organizations that really helped with this. So I'm going to toss it to Maddie Strasberger, who is with DAAA, and she's going to say a few words about um, uh, what they're up to. But thanks, everyone, for watching.
Good evening, everyone. As Dave introduced, I'm Maddie Strasberger, class of 2010, and I'm one of the co-chairs for DAAA, the Duke Asian Alumni Alliance. I first want to also thank Amy Unell and the Demon team for all their great work in pulling this event together. And I also want to thank Dave and the panelists tonight for such a great um, and fascinating conversation. Before we completely wrap, we also want to take a moment to extend further gratitude to the dozens of collaborators across Duke who assisted us tonight with outreach for this viewing and talk back. On behalf of DAAA, we also wanted to take a quick moment to highlight some upcoming events, which includes our How to Keep Your Heart Healthy event on February 22nd, um, another exciting demon collaboration on April 7th of Breaking into Hollywood, a conversation with Asian American creatives, and our first annual DAAA symposium on May 21st, so more information to come. And now I want to take a moment to turn it over to Brooke for final thoughts. Awesome. Thanks, Maddie, and thanks, DAAA. And as Maddie mentioned, thank you so much to all the panelists and attendees tonight. Uh, my name is Brooke Levin, one of the co-chairs of the Duke LGBTQ Plus Network, and I'm here to quickly share a couple of housekeeping items and a few other uh, upcoming programming events that you may be interested in attending. Uh, first off, you can stream tonight's conversation along with seasons one and two of Demon Live, which I highly recommend, on arts.duke.edu backslash demon, D-E-M-A-N, uh, on February 18th, the network is excited to once again come up with Demon Live for Duke's Got Talent Out West, where we hope you can join us as we watch a bunch of talented Duke alums put on an amazing show. Uh, speaking of Duke talent, the music we heard before tonight's panel, and we'll hear again as we wrap up, is by Duke's Vice Provost for the Arts, John Brown. Thank you, John, for sharing your music with us. Are you a Dukey hoping to break into creative industries? Don't miss Navigate Your First Jobs in Creative Industries with Demon Live and the Duke Career Center on February 24th. Uh, lastly, on February 11th, you we hope you can join the uh, Duke Black Alumni and the Duke LGBTQ Plus Network for our first ever joint event to tackle important questions around the intersection of race, sexual orientation, and gender identity through a program titled Black and LGBTQ Plus at Duke, A Journey in Resilience and Progress. You can find more information about these programs and more by logging into your account at dukealumni.com. And to close up the night, thank you all again for joining us. And until we meet again, stay safe, be well, and go Duke.